Access Wireless Digital is the perfect wireless audio solution for content creators and filmmakers. Thanks to a 2.4 GHz transmission, XS Wireless Digital is a truly plug-and-play system that allows you to upgrade your in-camera audio with one button operation. With a variety of configurations to choose from, this entry point into the world of wireless will improve your workflow and will expand the possibilities of how you capture audio for your video. For more information, visit Sennheiser.com slash XSWD. The new Super 35 sensor that Canon have introduced with the C300 Mark III is quite a big step up from other S35 sensors that they have created before. From the body and the flexibility that gives us in terms of the expansion packs and the interchangeable mount, to the sensor with its increased dynamic range for tackling scenes that possibly we couldn't have tackled or captured faithfully before. I can get more out of this camera. My money goes further. It's as simple as that from a business standpoint. From a creative point of view, it's unquestionably unlocking more creative avenues for us as filmmakers.
XS Wireless Digital is the perfect wireless audio solution for content creators and filmmakers. Thanks to a 2.4 GHz transmission, XS Wireless Digital is a truly plug-and-play system that allows you to upgrade your in-camera audio with one-button operation. With a variety of configurations to choose from, this entry point into the world of wireless will improve your workflow and will expand the possibilities of how you capture audio for your video. For more information, visit sennheiser.com slash xswd. The new Super 35 sensor that Canon have introduced with the C300 Mark III is quite a big step up from other S35 sensors that they have created before. From the body and the flexibility that gives us in terms of the expansion packs and the interchangeable mount, to the sensor with its increased dynamic range for tackling scenes that possibly we couldn't have tackled or captured faithfully before. I can get more out of this camera. My money goes further. It's as simple as that from a business standpoint. From a creative point of view, it's unquestionably unlocking more creative avenues for us as filmmakers.
Hi, welcome to ProV TV. Thank you so much for joining us on this nice, warm, sunny day if you're here in the UK with us. Um, we are joined by none other than our good friend Ollie Kensington. Thank you very much for joining us again. Welcome back to the channel. It's actually been quite a while, hasn't it, Ollie? It has been a while, yes. It's nice to see you again, mate. Absolutely. So what are we talking about September, today? wasn't it? I think about September. Yeah, C70 launch, I think was our last one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I've been hibernating since then. <laughs> Living your life as a colourist in a... In, in my a... black box. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Very grey box. Yeah. <laughs> So we have got a great stream for you today. I'm quite excited for this little chat today because I've, I've always been a bit of a, a lighting, um, have a bit of a soft spot for lighting. Of all the lovely equipment that we get to deal with here at Pro V, lighting has always been the one that's tickled my interest the most. Um, I'm a bit of a bit of a nerd for for lighting. If this happens, by the way, throughout <laughs> everyone, yes. uh, it, have a go at Ollie in the chat because he's not using one of his proper cameras, which he's got lots of. He's using his little um, Arios R, which is going blacking out on us every um, five or Blame ten minutes. So it I is say. Ollie's fault, and he will keep going black like that. I apologise, everybody. Honestly, he's meant to be a professional. <laughs> well, Microsoft don't deal with the EOS webcam utility very well, it turns out. Oh, dear. Um, so, yeah, if that does happen, please forgive us. We Ollie will get it um, back up and running again imminently. Um, so, yeah, we are talking about lighting. We've we So this is a light panel stream. So you've partnered with light panels to produce this little series of of video content um, around the power of colour in lighting. Do you want to explain a little bit about this project and the idea behind this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's um, it was really born out of the work that um, I started doing with light panels probably about two years ago, I think. Um, mm. So I'm a light panels ambassador. So as, as, as some of your viewers may know, I, I shoot as well as um, do post-production. Um, mm. And uh, what I've always liked doing um, is using all of the disciplines that I kind of uh, focus on to kind of inform the others. So um, certainly I've found over the years I've become a much better cinematographer, the better I've got at editing and colour grading mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and vice versa. And I think it's really important to have your hand in a couple of different disciplines. Um, it really does help you see the processes that you go through whether it's as a camera operator cinematographer or uh you know gaffer or whatever it might be and we hadn't really it some of those things are very straightforward it's like i'll often do stuff with canon for example and i'll be doing it from the point of view of post-production we'll be talking about color grading and you know there's, there's direct connections there you know in terms of uh acquisition codecs and hdr and all that kind of stuff but there's not um a huge amount of stuff out there that's um, really tying the impact of colour um, at the production stage in the in the form of lighting. Mm -hmm. um, I think more and more with uh, RGB fixtures and, and WW RGB fixtures that um, um, you've got with the, the Geminis, you're, we're seeing more people using colour. It's becoming a lot more accessible, obviously. Um, I think pretty much every music video that's been made over the last 12 months has had some form of uh, uh, RGB colour tint going on there. Um, it's very of the moment. And I think um, it was a, a kind of good timing, really, You know, getting together with light panels, talking about ways that we can work together. Initially, that started with just straightforward accuracy. Um, as you know, um, my focus very much being on uh, colour accuracy and consistency and how that helps me in terms of post-production has become a quite a central theme to the work that I do and certainly with the um, commercial partners that I work with. And uh, so that was kind of the starting point. And uh, I did some talks with light panels around that, just simply around how accurate the, the, the Geminis are in particular, how flexible mm -hmm. they are in terms of their wide range of uh, Kelvins that you can rate them to, uh, not least the kind of the, the, the gels uh, and the uh, color effects that you can use with them, but um, just straightforward white light and, and how good they are. Because I think a lot of people, particularly the two by one, the Gemini two by one, it often gets compared to Ari's sky panel. And it comes out really favorably almost all the time whenever you have any conversation with people, even if they're diehard, you know, sky panel fans. Um, the, the Gemini 2x1 kind of 
uh, top trumps that that particular light in, in pretty much every regard. It's considerably lighter. Um, it's got better color accuracy. Um, and I think that's where this all started with light panels was just talking about how good their lights are and trying to communicate that and therefore communicate about how important that that um, ability to reproduce clean white light is. And then we kind of obviously started thinking, well, how how can we expand this? And my personal personal expertise in terms of color, basic color theory, how we could kind of meld that into a, a short series and, and really show what can be achieved with these lights and how you can use them to enhance your uh, the production stage, enhance the, the kind of use of color, whether that's giving depth, using um, complementary colors to create depth um, or um, what, and probably one of my most favorite ones was uh, in the series is when we just look at uh, how they mix. So having a situation where we were in a, a you know, a kitchen, uh, we'd hired a kitchen to shoot a spec commercial for a, a well-known brand with very vivid, colorful packaging. And, uh, you know, so many windows, so much light coming in um, and how you can use lights that are so flexible in their Kelvin rating, uh, as well as, you know, being highly accurate how we can uh, measure mixed light sources and then match that with the Geminis and end up with a very color critical piece uh, where the, you know, the, the brand packaging is paramount and, uh, and make sure that that actually is completely consistent to the point where you shouldn't have to do any color correction uh, in post-production at all. Which we didn't sure. I, let, let's job. start with that because that that is really the core concept here, isn't it? It's it's mm. about getting as much of the the color right in um, camera as possible, so that yeah. it's not so that you don't have to do as much work in post production, but it's so that you don't have to waste your time in post production correcting absolutely. irritating little problems. Yeah, um, which can actually be really quite challenging, especially if you're not a very experienced colorist. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just such a waste of time. It's kind of soul destroying when you mm. have an have an image that you know you, there's so much you can do with it, and there are problems you have to deal with. Whether whether mm -hmm. that's noise, whether that's uh, exposure issues, whether that's just tinting, consistency across the frame. You know, the, what I've noticed. Um, over the progression of my career is that as you as you steadily climb up the ladder and work with bigger and bigger production companies and agencies and the quality of the work that you're being given and that you're handing back at the end just starts to go up and up and up it actually gets so much easier because everyone's doing their job correctly mm. and the, the equipment that you're using is the you know as good as it can be for that level of equipment and although that's fantastic, you know, when you find yourself in that situation and, and it allows you to really start to divert your energies into far more creative um, uh, endeavors and, you know, trying to do some, particularly with color grading, some of the wonderful things you can do in terms of storytelling with, with color and with contrast. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to just think solely about that and not worry about corrective stages. For me and you know, the teacher in me, if you like, the you know, I've been training for 15 odd years now. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, that side of me can't help but feel sorry for people that are still, you know, further down the rung or starting earlier on in their careers who are having to deal with these with these problems, with these, um, you know, situations, whether that's cheaper, less accurate lights or, um, you know, uh, uh, just the camera that they're using, the color science with the cameras that they're using or a lack of understanding of how to get the best from the camera. Um, and so I felt like a series where we can kind of touch on these things, really intertwine um, some of the color theory stuff, some of the things that we do as colorists in terms of pushing color into shadows and highlights and working with skin tones and complementary colors as well as the more corrective steps, but in production, all of this in uh, production so that it's happening at the point of acquisition, I thought could be a really interesting and quite um, novel series, hopefully. So let's start, before we start talking about the lighting specific stuff, about mm. some of the basic things which people can do in camera to get this right. And we've had this conversation many times, but for the sake of keeping sure. it all together in this stream, let's... Um, Let's yeah. go over it quite quickly. What, what are your main top tips, um, aside from the lighting, of how can people get and make sure that they are setting themselves up in the best way to get reasonably accurate colors? 
it it always starts with white balance, which is the most boring thing in the whole yeah. world. Um, one of my uh, I used to teach on a BA film years ago, and one of the students christened me the white balance guy, which I never quite got to the bottom of whether that was meant to be an insult or not. Um, but it was just a, a constant I think, I think it's both at the same the time. Screen. It's a little insulting, but at the same time, there's, quite there's, flattering. Yeah, there's tinges of uh, passive aggressive there. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it, it's surprising, really. From a colour point of view, when, when we're setting our white balance, what we're doing is we're setting the centre of the colour matrix. So the colour matrix is the way that this camera is interpreting all of the um, debayed information it's cap capturing from the sensor. And that colour matrix can be changed. It's different from manufacturer to manufacturer. Yep. Yep. You can, within the camera itself, you can choose slightly different colour matrices, matrices, I should say. Um, so, for example, you know, I'm using obviously Canon, uh, the neutral colour matrix that's standard with all of Canon's uh, current crop of cinema, EOS and uh, um, their latest mirrorless and also DSLR cameras. That, that colour matrix, for example, is designed to be incredibly faithful, true to life and also be absolutely consistent from camera to camera. If that colour matrix is orbiting around the wrong central point, which is what setting the white balance is doing, then it means not just white is wrong, you'll see every single thing is wrong and it's not even necessarily wrong equally. Um, you can also, uh, when it comes to the lights, if you, if you um, get that wrong, but then also are using lights that are introducing tint. So may maybe it's cheaper LEDs that, you know, we've probably all experienced cheap LEDs with the uh, either a, a limey yellow tint or a, a magenta tint. Mm -hmm. um, I had some LEDs not so long ago uh, in my pre light panels days um, that started out fairly accurate. And um, over the year or 18 months that I had them yeah. just got progressively more and more pink. You just forget um, so about them for a while, but using them and before you, you, you know it, just, you, you, you look at them again crazy. with a for the first time in about a year with an objective view and go, hang on, did they yeah, used to be this colour? <laughs> it's it's not right, you know, and it's not like you can do anything about it. It's not it's not like, you know, you've been using, I don't know, like a gel or something that's slowly faded or, you yeah. know, like the X-Rite charts, you know, they're consumable technically. You're meant to kind of replace them every year or so. Yeah. The more sunlight hits them, the more you're, you know, bleaching the pigments in them and, and essentially they're becoming less useful. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like that with an LED. You know, if an LED starts going pink, and unless it's in warranty and you can kind of get a panel replacement, it's not something that can just be fixed, really. Um, so it's really important that, first of all, you understand with the camera that you're, as I said, you know, white balancing properly, using color matrices correctly and, and getting everything kind of set up, but also the light within your situation is you're in control of that, whether that's meant to be clear and white and, uh, and therefore the color of your objects is meant to be accurate and, and come forwards. Or as we probe in the sort of the further parts of this series, deliberately introducing tints. Um, there's one episode which is quite fun where we deliberately shoot off temperature. So we're introducing uh, colour into shadows, colour into skin, into highlights um, by deliberately rating the white balance incorrectly in the camera and then pushing one set of Gemini's one way and one yeah. set, uh, set of Gemini's another way. So yeah. it's you know it's, it starts with an understanding of of, of where neutral is because once you fully understand that not only does that make faithful um, capture and reproduction of, of your talent or subject or whatever it might be um, as good as it can be obviously once you know that you can then start to push off in in, in other areas and deliberately introducing um, uh, those color tints and enhancing the you know even right down to the three-dimensionality of an image you know there's n it's no coincidence that um, I've made the most of a brick wall here behind me um, <laughs> because, uh, you, you know, the and, and I try and wear as much as possible blue um, tops whenever I'm um, doing things like this, you know, th there are certain things that you can do to really um, add depth to an image. And depth is important because ultimately this is a two-dimensional medium. Everything that we're watching back is on a two-dimensional plane. So what you're doing, whether it's with lighting or colour or contrast or all of all of the things really that we do, wardrobe, um, set design, everything, it's all working together um, to ideally create the illusion of reality, the illusion of three dimensions, because the more um, seductively kind of three-dimensional an image looks, 
the more enveloping it becomes, the more you get lost in in what you're watching, more absorbed in the narrative, you know, and engaged in what you're watching. And if if that's not there, you know, it, it, you're completely distant from it. You're not you're not absorbed in it at all. Absolutely. So I've spoken to lots of customers over the years that when we talk about white balancing, they just say. I stick it at 5600 or 3200 and you know if I want it warm or cooler I just push it one way or the other what more is there than that um what what would you say to to people that do it that way well there's one of the things and we address this directly in the series is is um there's an awful lot of strangely that's a very oh hello I've gone black I'm so sorry <laughs> let me uh <laughs> I'm still here. I promise. Watch Dan desperately try and cut to something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So one of the things we address directly in this series is this very odd, persistent myth that daylight is always one temperature. Yep. Um, it's it's shocking how prevalent it is. I, I do this little thing when you know in the those crazy old days where we used to do things like this face to face. I don't know if you remember oh, them. Carl. Remember those? Remember the People before used days? People stand closer than two meters uh, from us, and we would talk to them without masks. It was strange, crazy days. Um, and used to do workshops, you know, around lighting, you know, all the time. Um, used to do them quite yep. frequently, whether that was cinematography workshops and we were sort of just discussing lighting as part of that or solely lighting workshops, you know. Um, we used to do that an awful lot. And when you would start talking about, you know, the initial status of the kind of the basics, white balancing your camera, I would always, so we typically run these courses with between six and ten, six, eight people's kind of common number, all from various backgrounds. We get all kinds of people coming on these courses and you would say, right, so we're going to white balance the camera. Um, uh, we've got, to, and I'll turn off all the house lights so there'd be no artificial lights on at all. We'd have the windows open in, in, in the space where we were teaching. So there'd be daylight coming in. We would typically be teaching this around sort of like early afternoon. And you'd say to everyone in the room, right, we're going to white balance the camera. So what color temperature do we set it to? And there would be a kind of a little bit of an uncomfortable silence. And then you say, well, we've got daylight coming in. Does anyone know the color temperature of daylight that we should match the camera to? No one wants to say. And the then you know, kind of thought, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I know this one. And then pretty much everyone would be right. Yeah, 5,600 Kelvin. Like, yep. Cool. So and you'd, you'd kind of like, you know, you'd you'd slightly set them up for the full. You're like, cool. So everyone agree daylight is 5,600 Kelvin. Oh, yes. Lots of lots of affirmative nods going on in the room. And then what we would do is, is we would very simply get a, uh, a white, um, uh, you know, white balance card out. We'd go over to the window to minimise as much as possible. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Um, to minimise as much as possible any um, light that's bouncing off of things in the room and contaminating it. So we'd go right next to the window. We would turn the white balance chart to face the light coming directly through the window. And we'd white balance off that manually. Uh, in the camera and see what the camera told us and I would say more often than not being in this country it'd be somewhere around seven and a half thousand there was one quite funny day where it was really overcast it was winter um, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon I think and um, on the other side of the road um, where we often did these workshops there it was a big building with uh, like a uh, it was painted dark bluey gray and and also the building we were in was north facing right so you've got north facing building middle of the afternoon in winter overcast day and a big building on the opposite side of the road that's like painted like a bluey gray and the light the, the color temperature of the daylight coming into that room was we measured it at just under 9000 kelvin and you can imagine you know, everyone's reaction in the room. They've just all confidently said to me, oh, yes, of course, daylight's 5,600. If you had rated your camera at 5,600 and you had started filming in that room bathed in 9,000 Kelvin light, you, you know, obviously everything would have looked wrong. Um, and as I say, you know, if, if your camera's orbiting, its color matrix is orbiting around uh, a white point that's so v massively out of tune with actually the white point of the light that's coming into your space, every single thing is then spun off in God knows where. Um, 
And, and you know, you need to know it when you're trying to match it with lighting and all the rest of it. And and actually, a lot of normal bicolor lights only go up to about six thousand five hundred Kelvin. It's a big, it's a big problem. Yeah. So the uh, the Gemini's go from I think it's two thousand to ten thousand. Yeah. I think. Maybe. Yeah, because they're RGB, so, so they've yeah, got so, that extra you know, color information. Got a pull huge from. amount of flexibility there. So that that example when we measured at nine thousand with the Gemini's, we can actually dial that in, and that's that's the whole point of that little exercise that's we good. do is we we measure it so that we can then match that with our lights and that pucker um spec commercial that you showed the uh the still yes. for earlier okay, um and that that's go. from that uh that episode in this series where this whole space i don't know if you've got any of the behind the scenes stuff or not but um, um there was a uh, no the only, that, that I've got kitchen that. is and uh, no, okay it doesn't matter it's, that, that kitchen one, is um i think there's uh, well, it's a good reason for people to watch the series because there's all there the behind-the-scenes footage. Um, yeah. There's uh, a nice shot that shows you. I think there's like a skylight, one really long window down one side, one side of the room, like the kitchen is open plan with a like a conservatory, which is entirely glazed. There's another window on the other side. It's just absolutely flooded with daylight. Um, and all we do is measure the color temperature of that daylight we got lucky it was a fairly consistently overcast day so there wasn't going to be a huge amount of variation certainly in the kind of you know probably what amounted to probably 20 30 minutes worth of actual shooting that we were doing in that setup um but measuring what that is with the camera you know which you know we're just talking about a manual white balance that's all we're talking about here the camera then tells you exactly what the, uh, the measured kelvin is and we'll even show you any kind of color correcting um, tint plus or minus green yep. um, and then you can just match that you just dial that into your to your light so you've now got a situation where there's one consistent color of light uh, across everything so you you are excuse Camera's me gone again. you are um doing as as we said right at the beginning you're doing what um what you what should be everyone's goal which is at the point of acquisition everything is perfectly aligned and that mm -hmm. that pack shot that hero shot that you just brought up um in the series i i show myself working on that in in resolve in post-production and show a before and after and have the vector scope up there's no um it's always very important for me to not kind of hide stuff from people not mm -hmm. you know i hate those uh, demonstrations where you, you know it's like uh, i don't know why it always makes me think of like those warp transition you know the ones where like in theory you can get rid of a jump cut and no one will ever know and uh, <laughs> and they always demonstrate it on footage that just happens to be perfect so that you, you it works and yep. and you do it yourself and it's like what it's like, hang on <laughs> it's, just meant to, it's just meant to hide all my jump cut um i'm i'm always conscious of making sure that i'm i'm not demonstrating stuff with kind of pre-set up stuff so with all the stuff i do but certainly in this series as well I'm at, you know, I'm in here where I am right now at my, uh, um, in my grading suite and I'm taking people through the stuff and I'm showing them ungraded and the graded, I've got the vector scope up, they can see exactly. And you see the vector scope grow because obviously we're pushing in saturation and, and contrast into the image to develop it from the log. But you, you can see the vector scope doesn't suddenly shift. It doesn't suddenly move where I've color corrected or, or got rid of any kind of tint within the image because there was none. It's just as, as simple as that. There was nothing in, in that. So when you've got, uh, in this case, packaging, you know, brand packaging, uh, and particularly with this particular product, it's one of the reasons why we chose it is because there's a yellow for a turmeric. It's uh, made by a company called Pucker Herbs, who actually a local company. They're best, based in Bristol, just up the road from us. Oh, are they really? And, um, you know, they, they some art department and marketing department and creative agency have worked really hard to come up with brand packaging and colors and you know the illustrations everything about that um to convey that product in this case you know the yellow one at the front is like a turmeric latte tea thing um and uh you know that they for the cinematographer to capture that and it to be wrong is from in my book pretty pretty much top of the list of heinous crimes and photographers get this right photographers have got this for a long time if you were a if this was a still if if my job was a photographer and i took this and the packaging looked wrong if the white marble worktop looked off 
um, if there was clearly tints in it, if it didn't look correct, if someone went to the shops to buy this product and it didn't look like this, you would never work again. There'd be hell to pay. And every photographer knows that, you know, in the same way that, you know, color charts are used by pretty much every photographer. They, they wouldn't even think twice about it. And the irony is in photography, you've got huge amounts of latitude. You know, if I'm shooting raw stills, you know, 16 bit and higher, um, and uh, they've got the latitude to actually correct these problems, but they're just disciplined. They know how to get this right. And in cinematography, we've kind of allowed this culture to develop. Certainly, you know, and you, you watch people coming up through their education kind of steps in film schools where I don't think there's enough emphasis on as photographers would have is about this must be right. It's far more, yeah, set it, like you say, set our, you know, our lights to 5,600 Kelvin, rate the camera at five, dialing in color temperatures. It's really prevalent. Um, and it's actually something that um, you've got far less room to, to, to kind of compensate for those, those errors that creep in because well, you're, you're shooting mostly eight, 10 bit. Absolutely. You know. And the, the biggest reason I hear that people don't do all of that stuff is speed. But that's a funny argument to me because, you know, either, OK, you don't correct it and therefore you end up with bad work that, as you say, doesn't please a, a client and mm. most importantly, but just misrepresents something like a product, like in this case, tea. Um, or um, they spend ages trying to correct it in post, which is just yeah. backwards, really, isn't it? Why, why save two minutes yeah. on set to spend two hours in post? Yeah, yeah. And, that, and as I say, you, you know, even if you're, a, you know, a cam op for hire and you and you just hand over the rushes at rushes the end and the day, you yeah. know, send out for your invoice, people are going to start to notice, you know, this whole industry is built on relationships, on repeat Absolutely. business, or at least, you know, if you're doing well, it should be. And it's unsustainable to constantly be looking for new clients because all of your old ones, you know, maybe they can't put their finger on it. But if they, if they if they're getting stuff from you and there's a lot of extra work, maybe for all you know, you've you've shot something, you've handed off your invoice, you forget about it. And then, you know, the colorist is then communicating with the agency saying, Jesus, I've had to do so much work just to get this right. The image is now really thin. I've had situations where um, the client has fed back to the agency about a grade I've done where, you know, this isn't the right um, color. This isn't saturated enough. This is this looks too yellow. It should be more red or whatever it might be. And and I have to then communicate to the agency. There's there's really I've pushed it as far as I can. This image is now starting to break down because I've had to go so far to get to here to then start to actually implement the creative yep. choices yep, that your yep. client wants. That, you know, and if you're shooting 8-bit, forget about it. Even with 10-bit um, and 42 and higher, there's a limit. There is a limit. The resolution um, and quality of an image in, in video is, is nothing compared to stills. And you just don't have that wiggle room. I also think in the photography world, there's, it's far more common that the photographer is also the person doing the edits and the retouching and the, the delivery. So they they... they they see the results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what I said right at the start of this. You know, when you're shooting, you become a better colorist. When you're color grading, you become a better cinematographer. Editing, cinematography, they're, they're inextricably linked, obviously. And one informs the other. And if you are responsible for all of the different components of it, you become far more disciplined. And, you know, you do become that person that people want to work with. I I'd certainly feel it with agencies who are sending me top-notch, 100 percent you know technically accurate beautifully lit well shot footage and and you just you just kind of skirt through it and and it feels easy and it feels like you've got plenty of brain power left to do the really exciting parts of it so um, that that's sometimes the more the more thing that i hear the most about um so i mean a lot of times agencies and clients are just used to the the not perfect way of working that they don't think twice mm. about it having to correct all this stuff but when you are a camera operator that does give them stuff where they have to mm. do very very little to it yeah. really gets noticed and then all it of a does. sudden you're that person on set that yeah. is making everyone's life easier and yeah. what a what what an amazing situation to be in that is it's, it's funny if if every single person put as much energy into into becoming that person <laughs> as they did you know building a website or a show reel or you know any of these other sorts of things yeah it it makes a huge difference you know i i run a corporate film production company i i outsource all the time we're doing a big shoot tomorrow obviously I've outsourced for a second camera operator soundy you know there's people that i'm hiring in to work with me all the time and 
quite you know it develops over time but you get to a stage soon enough when you're working with the same people all the time <clears throat> because you want to <laughs> why wouldn't you want to who why would you pick up the phone and book you know a, a, a b camera operator uh, who you know is going to give you problems later on. You know, I'm going to book the sure. person who I know their stuff is is great. And in fact, the the camera operator that I've got booked for the shoot that we're doing tomorrow, um, I've known him for years. I absolutely adore his work. He sends me his uh, other projects to grade all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's something quite intimate. The colorist's relationship with someone's a cinematographer's footage is really intimate in a way that n very few other people get. You know, you get to see the the raw image not necessarily raw but you know what i mean the yeah, unfettered the, um, image straight from, from their set camera image, you yeah. see all of the mistakes all of the issues and you know when i get when i'm getting stuff from someone it's just gorgeous you know it's, it's just lovely stuff and you just know it's been done right mm. um and it becomes a pleasure to work with that stuff and and with them um obviously they're the people you pick up the phone to so it's yep. it's not um, it's and not the better the work stuff. ends up being because you can just simply spend more time on the creative aspects. Yeah, yeah. And imagine more how much you bring on. to the set. If you turn up and you're a camera operator, but you've, you know, spent time talking, you know, thinking about lighting. A lot of people, you know, of course, in the high end of the industry, you've got your director of photography, you've got your gaffer, you've got spark, you've got there's so many different layers responsible just for the lighting and the capturing of that light. Obviously, as you filter down, um, you're doing more and more of that st stuff yourself. So even if you are brought in just as a cam op, um, but probably more likely at the start of your career, you're brought in to just do everything. You know, imagine how useful you become as you start to work in bigger and bigger teams. If you can bring something and say, well, you know, why don't we push in this color into the background? Because it will pick up with this. It will then complement to the color that's in the wardrobe and it will work really nicely with their skin tones. and It will create a much more, you know, uh, um, captivating image, you know, to, to really know what you're talking about with with these things uh, um, and have hands on experience with them, I think is, is that stuff that gets you um, more and more work absolutely so let's bring this back to lighting a little bit um so mm -hmm. you know you can do a manual white balance easily enough mm -hmm. with one of these you can find out what color temperatures you've got going on in ambient lighting you can then match it with a good light like a gemini for example mm -hmm. yeah. um but and then you can do you know another final white balance to just check everything's right and natural and i, I guess a lot of people would then go okay well why do i need such a color accurate light then why wouldn't the way on your white balance take a lot of the imperfections out yeah so it's about consistency um so a light that you turn on and then and the measurable you know temperature of that light is consistent yeah so there are you know i've worked with lights that they're pretty good but then half an hour later you check them and they've drifted quite substantially i've already said about the lights that i bought and within 18 months they'd gone not just not just I'm a colorist, I can see that there's got some pink in that. I mean, proper full on pink. Yes, they I were can making... notice kind of pink. <laughs> <laughs> they were, we'd use them for like backlights and stuff. And, and we started noticing that everyone's hair just looked <laughs> they'd really all, They'd all had pink. the hair dye out, yeah. <laughs> it's just awful, you know. So it, you need, um, it's all very well being technically kind of savvy about how to do this and, and get this right in camera. But if the lights are letting you down, then you're off to a losing start straight away. There's also so one of the first things that I do with any new light that I'm working with is um, it helps obviously that we've got a, a color critical you know, environment here. This is a mm -hmm. proper color grading suite set up. So apart from this one tiny bit of brick wall behind me, um, the whole of the rest the of the room The one bit is, of it we can um, see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trust me, I have had this before. Ooh, why do you why do you have a yes. color grading suite with tungsten bulbs in it? Right. Like, this is just this is just for when I'm doing zooms and stuff, guys. Don't <laughs> so um, <laughs> when uh, obviously these lights are all off. Um, this is you know special. Um, uh, GTI paint it's got zero pigment in it so any light that hits it isn't tinted as it bounces back off the lights we use are very very high quality accurate um, color critical um, 6500 Kelvin bulbs so it's a perfect environment actually for measuring and testing lights um, and a simple test is the benchmark we use is tungsten tungsten lights um, obviously there are issues with them getting hot um, and uh, bulbs Drawing going huge amounts of power look at them the wrong way and and such like but um in terms of color accuracy um and rendition 
um, and the and the color rendering um, sort of index that that the, the measurement of um, the light that's um, output from them, the wavelengths of light coming from them, it's mm-hmm. it's the, the second best light source that we know of mm-hmm. after the sun. So you've um, probably people have these kicking around. It's a great benchmark. So simply measure a uh, a repeatable color. So um, the CR we talk a little about, bit about this in the in the series about the history of CRI, where those tests came from, what they were based on. And you know they're 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 old. They, you know they go back to uh, um, the sort of research that was going on in the late part of the 19th century, the Munsell um, system itself, which came about in the 20s and 30s. So um, you know it's a very old system, and this is why TLCI and other systems have have come uh, as a as a better way of measuring these things. But if you just want a simple test, just to see how well one uh, a, a camera records something with um, uh, tungsten light and then just literally replace that light with a with your led source and just do it again and mm-hmm. all you do is then just look at the vector scope in post you know and and because everything else is the same any shift in color you know is simply down to how well that light is is rendering so you set your led light to 3200 kelvin to match the white point of the tungsten and you just see how far they go um i use the extra color color checker charts um uh, they've got the uh, rec 709 chromaticity references on them for the primary and secondary colors so it's a perfect way of um, judging a video signal anyway and uh, when i did that with the gemini's when i first got them i did this with cameras as well you would have heard me talk about this with with cameras as well but um, when i did this with the gemini's when i first got them um, the vector scope if you have it side by side so we actually talked about this before we went live about having those vector scopes up there's such little difference between them. Really, you need to have them popping up and going one one in front of the other to even see the, the tiny difference. There's ba- basically almost no um, shift in the way that all of the different primary and secondaries are, are, are displayed on that vector scope as you move from a tungsten to so just a, a, a one kilowatt um, you know, redhead tungsten source. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the Gemini's at the same intensity uh, at 3200 kelvin and the, 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 you, there is no difference basically it's it's so minimal it's to the point of not worth um being significant at all whereas yeah. i've done that test in you know I'd, I'd always do that test so i've done that test in the past with lights and particularly red and green you know they're well off i've had ones where reds are, are rendering as almost pure magenta um and you do that so that you know well how much do i need to correct in post you know so you can work with those those lights but is it as we said, it's extra work. So you need to know our, and, and I've had, you know, even uh, had light sources where I've created LUTs, for, uh, camera LUTs based on those tests to correct that out so that whilst we're recording, it's essentially neutralizing that, uh, that problem with that particular light. So, you know, it's so we not just fun. Had a- couple of questions in chat which i'll just bring up so elsie is saying yeah. given the information about light losing their accuracy what brands are the better ones to work with and matt saying what's your favorite product at the moment i mean the main lights we're talking about here are the gemini's right yeah so yeah absolutely these are yeah. them on the um so this is light panels we've got a gemini two by one and then they've got a one by one so these are soft rgbww lights so i mean we obviously sell we sell lots of lights that are color accurate mm. um at all different price ranges so get in touch with the pro v team and we can help find you the right lights for you but what makes the gemini's so different really from a lot of the other ones is this rgb stuff so i mean obviously they're all they're a very high output professional studio light for high-end work but the the rgb part of them because they're ww as well on the end they don't sacrifice the white color accuracy in order to get a higher output or to get the RGB side of the light. that That's the main thing that sets them apart. The one by one in particular is is just such a flexible fixture. It, sure. You know, that size, being that size. So right now my key is a, a one by one, Gemini one by one. We've got the um, DOP Choice softbox and snap grid in there. You know, it's... It's incredibly flexible light. I was amazed when I first started using them how punchy they are, given yeah. that they're a one by one soft panel. And they're soft. Um, they really yeah. can output a, a good quantity of light. Um, but it, it, it always comes down to accuracy for me. It, it's um, Absolutely. You know, how well 
does it render white light and how consistent is that um, from fixture to fixture as well you know the the people manufacturers and this you see this in all products obviously but there there are manufacturers who just make something to a price and then there are people who make a product to the level that's required for professional use consistently from fixture to fixture sure. um and, and and i always think one of the closest similarities to to film lights particularly you know when we talk about leds uh of screen panels you know like whether it's a tv or a phone or whatever but you know you can spend thousands of pounds on an HDR TV or you can spend hundreds of pounds. Uh, and it's very easy to get sucked into, a, well, they're both 60 inch or they're both, you know, they both claim to be HDR. The proof is in the pudding. Once you've actually got that device, um, once you're looking at it with a few simple tests and over time, that will quickly reveal what those differences in price are. Some people go to the to the people who are making these panels and they go what's your cheapest one with the highest error rate and then there are people who go what are your most expensive ones with the lowest error rate yeah and 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 that's really what we're talking about here we're talking about a panel and a product that's been designed to a high specification for accuracy and consistency and and i don't know obviously price is going to be higher than people who aren't doing that um but uh, I think they're, you know, particularly that one by one, I think is, it represents very good value for money. And I often get people coming to me. It seems to be one of the most common questions I get with lighting people who are new to, to purchasing lights. Um, I've got about a grand or I've got about 1500 quid. What three point lighting systems should I buy? Mm -hmm. You know, and I would far rather and I often advise people to just spend their budget on one good light, a flexible light that can be used in a number of situations as a, as a really good key um, and then learn, you know, the, the sticky art of bouncing and manipulating and crafting and cutting and shaping natural light or uh, practicals or whatever it might be, um, rather than spending all of your money on three much lower quality lights thinking that somehow you know that that's that's better mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a bit of a film school you kind of feel you know you can only light things with with three lights you know, three you've got to have lighting your, setup yeah, yeah you've, you've got to have your key your fill your backlight you know it, it it obviously depends every situation is different but the compromises that come from just having one very high quality key are surmountable with some you know experience and using relatively cheap you know reflectors and yeah. black wrap and flags and bits and pieces the compromises you make by having three cheap lights well funnily enough i was having this conversation with a friend of mine about a week ago and uh he said that the three point lights that he got um because they fit his budget and he, he wanted three lights he said that um one of them caught fire oh <laughs> <laughs> right he said i should have done what you suggested ollie um uh it i won't name brands or or anyone individual but uh he's like it literally caught fire and, uh, oh wow okay wow that's that's interesting he said oh yeah but they they uh, fixed it with a firmware update which confused me not one that we sell i hope <laughs> I put a fire out. Ooh, um but you know i think the fans weren't kicking in and the circuits were getting too hot and it started smoking i mean god knows but um, yeah, that's quite an extreme example. That but. is probably quite an extreme example. <laughs> um, Elise has also just come back with, are they good for outdoor shooting as well? Have you used these much outdoors? I have. Um, they are, you know, you need to have uh, uh, some fairly good upper body strength to run these with a nice big chunky V-lock outside. But I have, I have done it. I have done uh, walkie talkies where we've uh, held these up, just running them off V-locks. They last a really good time, uh, particularly if you've got big chunky vlogs. We use them um, quite often. Sorry, prepping for a shoot tomorrow, so I've got a lot of stuff just behind me. But uh, um, we use these Anton Bauer um, Titans. There you go, <laughs> Snapsies. <laughs> so these got big chunky are the two forty Titan SLs, mm, uh, the big ones. Yeah, I mean, I can run with the one by ones. I think for a good couple of hours um, with one of those. Sure. Uh, so uh, yeah you know it, it, 
yeah, is the short answer. We've used them outside. The thing about daylight is it's always surprising just how bright it is, which sounds really dumb, but it's amazing how much uh, output from lights that you need to you, you need to crack up. So if you're thinking of buying an LED panel to, to use regularly for exteriors, you know, it, it just have, have some realistic expectations of what you're going to yeah, be able to I achieve. Mean, don't try and fight the sun. It, 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 lights to me outdoors should be used to complement and mould the sun yeah. and, and bring up some of the darker areas, things like that, rather than Absolutely. trying to fight yeah. or overpower. You're using it to manage the dynamic range. And, and Unless you've got a Hollywood budget and you've got huge 20Ks lining around you and all that sort of stuff, there is just no point even trying. Yeah. And, and it's not even budget necessarily, because one of the cheapest ways to deal with that situation is just reflection. <laughs> so, well, you know, just yeah. bouncing it back in. It, yeah. It's just, it, it's, yeah, it's the wrong, it's the wrong product. It's the wrong thing for the, for the job if you're trying to fight the sun with, with those things. Having said that, if you just want a, a little bit of fill, um, uh, or you're trying to get, to, you know, I've seen them used really effectively at, uh, in golden hour and even blue hour. Um, matching the the, the well, lights, so, you know, it goes it goes up to ten thousand Kelvin. So exactly. actually, they're really good for adding fill uh, and backlights at uh, in blue hour. So really a, lovely a, stuff. A big thing about the RGB panels is that they can match whatever the 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 ambient lighting, particularly when you're outdoors, is doing. They can match it whether it's a sunset or a, a dark and more moonlight. Or the one that I see really commonly is making the light purposefully worse to match sodium fixtures. So if you're out yeah. in street lights at night, you don't want a very color accurate light because you want the image to look bad because it, it's in a narrative purposes, it should be lit by sodium lights, which will look unbelievably ugly. <laughs> so yeah. all of the stuff that we've been talking about throughout here from a creative reason, you mm. actually want to completely go against it. Yeah. Um, well, that, and that's the thing. And that creative use of color is is the great thing about these lights. Is yeah, it's like it's, it's like a bonus. It's like this like switch, literally, that you flick, and suddenly mm. you've got this this color palette available to you. So one of the well, two of the episodes, but one in particular where we we um, <clears throat> we look at um, we kind of base it uh, around the idea of like a. a a fashion shoot mm. um but we're using uh our, the talents uh, our talents wearing a v sort of very bright lemony yellow dress this one right um yeah i think it's that one and you can see that's really nice behind the scenes actually you can see how we're we're booming the two by one the gemini two by one behind there um it's a rather heath robinson um bit <laughs> of uh <laughs> <laughs> some cinefoil just kind of directing that and controlling the spill which is particularly, is. Yeah. you know gaffers will make do with whatever they've got but uh, mm -hmm. um <clears throat> the uh the that sort of cyan tearly light that we're just pushing in you know it's subtle but it's uh just just looking at pushing in a little bit of color um and then we're all, of course we're also lighting our model so we're, this is yeah. an interesting one because we've got one we've got a gemini one by one which is our key and, and our catch in the eyes there lovely big soft um egg crate soft box on there um all of the things that we've already talked about about capturing that faithfully to give our faithful skin tones but then in the same scene at the same time dialing in a color to just let that fall behind so you have to be you know careful about letting it fall on uh, sure it's not polluting the, no, the skin exactly it's not and, and that's a very waters. simple a very simple setup there there's literally mm. some the, the the key lights actually uh, just on the right hand side there you can see it's on a uh, on the ground there um, mm. and then we're booming in that uh, that tuba one above just to to push in that little bit of teal in there then you this can do one that in a much more subtle way right this is this is subtle. This is meant to be, um, you know, sort of twilight, first thing in the morning. We've got the practical there. But this is the one I mentioned earlier where we're actually using two Gemini one by ones and we're off temperature. So one of them's at 2,700, one of them's at 3,200. And then the camera's rated at 2,900. Mm. So we're actually deliberately letting one of the lights go cool, one of the lights go warm, and then uh, you know, again, using <clears throat> frames, grids um, to angle and control that light to separate it from our subject in the background. And it gives this lovely, um, you know, particularly the 3200 light that's falling into the back of the room. That that room, that wall is grey. 
so it looks like it's it's like a really deep um, blue. Sorry, my light's gone. Uh, my camera's gone again. Um, it looks like it's a really deep kind of midnight blue, but that's actually a grey wall, and that mm. light is being pushed in there. The practical helps break that up. Um, and it helps tie it, otherwise it would be a little bit kind of as duo the, the wooden bed frame as well, which is quite nice. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. But it, you know, it, it was meant to be a kind of, a, you know, early, early sunlight starting to come in, um, quite pale, quite silvery in the shadows. Um, and also, more importantly, not done with the RGB parts of the light. Yeah. Or only done with the uh the the white light basically so we've had a couple of really good questions come in um actually about the rgb parts of the light so patrick is asking how do you find using the rgbw mode in the color menu selection do you ever use that mode um and how do you use it um i for one tend to use hsi modes rather than the rgbw mode do you yeah yeah i do i agree yeah and in fact um I wonder if possibly that's just the color part of my brain, just as the, the you know, I find that easier. Yeah. Uh, I, I probably, if I was like a graphic designer or something, I'd probably find the RGB bits a bit easier. But no, I tend to think of the the the, the hue that I'm trying to dial in and then intensify that hue or otherwise. Um, one of the shots you've got there, I think you've got one of um, uh, Tara. She's looking out of a window. She's looking up to a close of her face. This one. Yeah, so that was created with a, a two by Gemini two by one th uh, as a book light, um, so bounced and then and then the bounce light through a frame, um, and then there's a little uh, I've put a, a black cross of gaff tape across the trace frame to create the shape so that it looks like a oh. like a sash window in her eye. Um, yes. But that that's actually done using the, the built-in gels. So that's a straw gel, a quarter straw, I think, uh, from memory. Uh, so we probably can't see that very clearly on the stream, but we're talking about just that little glint, the, the catch light mm -hmm. in her eye um, yeah. actually has a, a cross in it um, to make it look like a natural window, which really helps sell the natural um, feel of the lighting there. It's um, something that I like to do anyway, but in that particular case, we start with a wide shot of her looking out of the window. So sure. we actually have to match that. Um, but uh, it, this was part of this pucker spec commercial. So the idea was that she's sat, she's looking out the window uh, and she's tea, sipping on this, yeah. this turmeric um, tea. So this is a little sequence where we've got these close ups of her sipping the coffee and, uh, and staring out of the window as the sun comes up. And, you know, we, we just shot we shot a back plate. Um, with a locked for the locked off wide, um, uh, and um, and graded the the outside the light because as if you remember it was overcast and we shot this at the end of the day as well, mm. uh, and I think it was a February, so it was it was it was not you know not <laughs> a lovely beautiful sort of summery sun sunrise at all, um, so we shot that as a background plate and I kind of graded that to look that way. And then all of this stuff where we've moved in closer is um, windows shut and um, and that's all just recreated um, artificially with the Gemini's, as I say, just using the the, the gel mode the, with mm. the straw, a little bit of practical know how, a bit of gaff tape just to create the kind of the shape and look of a window in the catch light with the eyes. But that's when you nice watch this as a sequence, it's, you know, you'd have no idea that this this wasn't the same natural light that was coming in in the, the the wide shot. They were shot at the same time, so it was literally one shot after the other. That the whole sequence was filmed in, you know, an hour or less. Um, but yeah, all end of the day, overcast February uh, day in England. So, so just coming back to Patrick's question, just very quickly there um, on his difference between the RGBW mode for, for me. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention quickly is when talking to customers about the people that do prefer each mode, often what I find people use RGBW mode for is trying to match specific colors or gels that they found online that aren't the ones which are preloaded into a light. So a light like the Gemini, for example, will have lots of gels matching yeah. sort of Lee filters, for example, um, built into the light. Um, but you can actually find a lot of that information online to match them. The other thing that it's useful for is dialing multiple lights. So say you've got 
a big set and you've got um you want a dark red lights being chucked on the background all the way around the back of it you can precisely match the same color values on each one by dialing in the rgb actual numerical values um hsi is more much more suitable in my opinion for this sort of fast paced work where you are you're doing a bit more creatively with one one light that you're putting into rgb mode and just playing about till you find something that looks really good mm. um dakiri music has just said for an rgb slash expressionist mixed color lighting setup is white balancing with an x-right card the first thing you do after all lights are set and this is a great chat by the way he says thank you very much dakiri music um yeah what what's the process when, when you're setting up for example let's just go back to something like this so you've 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 got a natural you've got a you've got a, a scene with natural light coming in, you've closed it out you've put your own lights in there at what points in there are you doing these sort of manual white balances with a natural gray card yeah so it well with this you know we've got skin we and and that that's a red flag instantly as soon as you're working and shooting skin unless there's a narrative justification um uh, for why that shouldn't look like skin um that's your priority so yeah. with this we did all of that white balancing and establishing that neutrality and that starting point so the skin looks accurate with our key all of that happened first and that, that and then by making sure that uh, that backlight wasn't spilling onto the face we are then completely at liberty to push that light where we want it mm -hmm. so we can make mm -hmm. that more or less blue we can move it around we can basically do whatever we like knowing that the face is protected and that and, and also the dress because the idea with this was it was meant to be a bit similarly to the kind of the brand packaging with the pucker mm -hmm. it's like you know this fashion this dress you know has this dress has to look correct when you then mm -hmm. go and pick it off the uh, the rail but you know, obviously it, it would be boring if everything was just clean white neutral so that you could say oh yes but that's actually what the dress looks like what, what we're trying to do here is take that to the next level so we've got the neutrality and the things that matter are accurate but then we're able to push things into the background or you know in this case of spinning onto the back of the hair to give us a nice interesting catch light a uh, backlight for the hair um and so that in that case you're, you're doing everything first and then and making sure there's no contamination with that light. Uh, what I thought you were going to say was, what do you do when when you've got nothing, no white light? And I have had mm. that before. I think the answer is obvious, but I have had people, you know, I, I had a wedding cinematographer once said, oh, what, how do I went to white balance when it's the disco at the end and there's all these different, you know, lights going off? It's like, well, you can't because there is nothing white. You know, you're white balancing when you when there's a white point to balance from and that will come from if there's daylight there yes. um or if you're what, establishing what sorry, i do camera. find some confusion on that point though is when there's multiple cameras involved in that sort of situation what yeah. i do often tell people to do is just find a spot where a lot of the white the the crazy lighting isn't hitting it and take each camera that you're working with white balance them there on the same point and then you can go into all the crazy lighting and at least they will <laughs> be at the same starting yeah, point. But that that's very much one of those things that you can establish ahead of time. Yeah. So if you've got multiple cameras, they're going to be as different from each other the, the morning of that shoot as they are the afternoon or evening of that shoot. Because then what you're getting into is the calibration between multiple devices, particularly if they're non-consecutive you know, consecutive manufacturers' cameras. Yeah. Um, and that's something you can establish. You can, you can establish, and you know, that's been happening in film forever. You know, the look of a certain film stock, you know, yep. how does that respond to certain lights? You know, this is why they shoot wardrobe tests and light tests in advance of, you know, capturing things and, and, then, and then checking that. So seeing how cameras respond or film stock responds, sensors, whatever it might be, you can establish all of that ahead of time so i mentioned it earlier about you know there's a particular type of light that you know the red doesn't render particularly well you can create your own lut to essentially counteract that and load that into the camera um so there would be no reason why you couldn't establish well how um different if we take a a, a white light and a gray card in a controlled environment and measure it with these cameras what do they all come up with how are they all different 
And then, you know, you've then, even if on the day <laughs> it all goes <laughs> crazy and you're like, oh, my God, I haven't got time to think about this. You've got that learning in the back of your mind. You know that I, I know that that camera it always comes up a bit warmer than the rest, you know. So you can start to make quick decisions that are, you know, they're, they're educated guesses rather than just kind of wild guesses. Um but certainly, I you know I, I've had pe again wedding um, cinematographers seem to be quite common because they they will often claim they have no opportunity to plan for any of this stuff, yeah. and it's like, well, is the church they're getting married in, you know, is that there now, you know, the week before you shoot it? Yes, right. What do you think it will be happen? Well, it might be sunny. Okay, well, well then go to that church ahead of time and take a white balance card with you and see what what does it get because you know it's not like we're talking about six months hence or wildly different they're relatively predictable if it's if it's a similar time of year and it's only a week away well you know the light's not going to be that different if it's if you go on a sunny day and, a, and an overcast day and and check and see what it looks like in that space it's almost certainly going to be the same when you actually come to do it i know it takes a bit more planning but but also, uh, I, you know, this guy said, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. I said, well, how often do you shoot in these things? Oh, it's always the same. Oh, apologies. He said, it's, always, it's almost always the same kind of two or three different churches in my local area. Like you could literally, you could essentially uh, kind of calibrate for these locations once. And that would do you for pretty much ever. <laughs> you know, if you did it because you they're mostly always happening in the summer they're mostly happening at the same time of day they're mostly happening in a in a space that you, the light doesn't change you know so that mm. you're actually able to kind of map these things in advance if you want to but uh i don't know it, it just becomes habit you know if you say to the same person well do you do you ever skip balancing or uh, well, actually, loads of people skip balancing their camera on their tripod. But do, do, do yeah, you ever example. skip? Yeah, do you Cleaning ever skip leveling your tripod? Just leveling uh, your tripod. Oh no! Yes. Yeah, well, I always make sure I've leveled my tripod. I'm like, well, you know, do you make sure your batteries are charged? Yes. Yeah, of course. Like, well, it's just it's just part of a workflow. The workflow, yeah. Dakiri Music has come back and saying, but what if there's only one camera and there is no white at all? Like, it's all blue well, and then red that's, and scene. Like a music video, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's where I thought thing. he was going. Mm. And I was actually going to say, that's the best. That's the easiest. Yeah. Because then you just set the camera at whatever. Um, and then you just tweak your lights accordingly. So, And um, you've, got to, you've got to accept in that sort of situation yes. that colours are not going to look right. You know, you are never in that situation going to get good skin tones. But that's that's fine that's the point of being in that situation is that you're yes. you yeah, want I your mean, skin tones to light... be red or blue or otherwise why are you doing that <laughs> the, the thing is that skin is a memory color so it's important we get it right because everyone knows what it looks like in normal lighting situations yeah. i have no idea what your or my skin looks like under a you know a, a vivid red disco light <laughs> so it, it's it then becomes irrelevant your creative license then means that it can be anything yeah. for me as a colorist what it becomes then is as i go from shot to shot is that red or blue or whatever it is that's on my subject yes. is it consistent and that's yeah. just a matter of learning how to use a vector scope and making sure as you go from shot to shot you're changing the angle and the intensity of that hue so that it matches from shot to shot now there's no reason you couldn't borrow that to a certain extent and uh, again get a, a gray balance card or white piece of paper or whatever you've got to hand uh, and if you've got access to that location or those lights in advance you you could just you know most monitors have built-in vector scopes even cameras have built-in vector scopes now so there's no reason why you couldn't actually analyze where does that light fall so so white balance your camera based on on your own white source um so that you know that it's accurate for a white source in that environment turn <clears throat> excuse me turn it off get your colored light on and just see where is that on a vector scope now because mm. that will be true to life that will be this it should be what you're seeing with your eyes if that makes sense so if you're comparing it to a known neutral start point analyzing where's that color going <clears throat> then you actually for example if you can go back the next day and you're shooting there and you've got an on, on camera monitor and you can see on the vector scope it's not where it should be then you know that something's gone wrong but you know that's probably overthinking it but the short answer is that actually it doesn't matter so much because you've then got you've got nothing to to ground people's expectations anyway 
So before we wrap up, let's generalize a little. So what 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 would you say are the main takeaways, the main thing that you want people watching this to take away um, from it in terms of using color within lighting? Um, it's it's deliberately it's difficult to kind of boil it down to one thing because actually mm. the whole point of this series was to try and cover quite a few different. Um, scenarios as, as we've discussed from from complete neutrality to very creative use of color from that creative use of color using the rgb mode to creative use of color using just white light and using off temperature um mm -hmm. so it's difficult to boil it down to one thing what i would what i would say is there's a i think you had it up on the screen at the beginning i've created an accompanying pdf yes, let me um, that goes with this series even if you watch the series, I'd strongly urge anyone to actually download and, and read that PDF. It, it, it does. You get a power of color and lighting uh, um, in-depth educational guide. So th this is on Light Panel's website. I yeah. am going to put a little link to it there in the chats so that you can get to it if you're watching this. Um, so this is where you can find Ollie's little series for light panels, which is here, four episodes on color consistency and accuracy, matching your sources, skin tones, and then complementary color theory. And then this free little PDF to guide. So I think, you know, that, that's, a really, <clears throat> that's a really good one. Um, it, it really dives into the, the kind of the underpinnings of what we're talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, I, sure. I guess if you, if you had to kind of isolate it it's it's thinking about lighting from uh the point of view of not just color for color's sake mm -hmm. or even white for white's sake but what does that mean and um, once you understand what that means then what where do you go from that basically so it's 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 an interesting series it's unlike anything i've done before mm. um and, and, and on the surface it might seem like where's the connection but this is why i say to download the pdf it actually quite um i, goes think, I think it does a good a job of really tying the thread between these things excellent um i think one one thing i'd like to just add there at the end which is something that comes up time and time again with customers is is really trying to encourage people to appreciate the importance of the light that you start with i mean we are a visual medium and as with anything in the world, whether or not we're pointing a camera at it or not, things only look the way they look because they're reflecting light off of it and into your eyes or into your camera. And so the quality and the color reproduction of that light that you're starting with in the first place is obviously hugely, hugely important. If it's deficient in any one particular area in its spectrum, that is going to translate into the way that your my red top here looks and you know the the chips on the posters behind you look um all of that really does make a big big difference um uh, in all sorts of work and it's something yeah. you can take into all areas that you do creating video you know whether that is like you say the the wedding videographer with no control over lighting and just has to deal with whatever is chucked at them but at least they can keep that in mind when they're working um or it's a it's a production shoot with lighting with a big bank of gemini's um i think just getting customers to to appreciate and value the spectrum of light that they're starting with is something that i try and really encourage people to think about here here right so um Obviously, if you want more information, anyone watching this about the series that we've been talking about all the way through, as we just said, it's up on Light Panel's website. I've stuck the link in chat to the power of color and lighting where you can watch the videos and download that PDF. And of course, there's a bunch of information there on Gemini's because it's Light Panel's website. And of course, if you want to buy either of the, the Light Panel's or any other lighting products in general or video products as a whole, get in touch with Pro V. Um, thank you so much for joining us and talking us through it all, Ollie. Thank it's been mate. great Pleasure. to talk to you again. Yeah, it's very nice to see you again as well. Absolutely. Let's not leave it so long next time. Absolutely. Let's um, schedule something else. <laughs> right. And thank you all so much for your questions. And thank you very, very much for watching. We will see you very soon. Um, if you're watching this, by the way, we have a stream. If you're watching this live, we have a stream 
tomorrow with Black Magic as well, um, where I'm sitting down with Craig Heffernan, who's the sales director for Black Magic um, in Europe, to just have a general chat about all things Black Magic. You know, their cameras, their software. You know, their their theory and approach to to cinematic production um, so i'm really looking forward to that one as well i think that'll be a great chat and this one will be available to watch um after the fact on our youtube channel and on our website so if you missed the beginning of it or anything like that it'll be there to catch back up on but yeah thank you for watching thank you very much once again ollie and i'll see you all very soon thank you mate bye take care The new Super 35 sensor that Canon have introduced with the C300 Mark III is quite a big step up from other S35 sensors that they have created before. From the body and the flexibility that gives us in terms of the expansion packs and the interchangeable mount, to the sensor with its increased dynamic range for tackling scenes that possibly we couldn't have tackled or captured faithfully before. I can get more out of this camera. My money goes further. It's as simple as that from a business standpoint. From a creative point of view, it's unquestionably unlocking more creative avenues for us as filmmakers.